Good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Glad that you're with us. And for those of you who are joining us online, we're glad that you're with us as well. So before Becky and I moved here to Milwaukee, we lived in Atlanta, and we served a church there for about nine years. It was a non-denominational church, which in many ways was very similar to Meadowbrook Church. And there was a stretch of time, probably about half the time we served that church, where it was a really hard season of ministry. Every time I turned around, it was like dysfunction, conflict, on the verge of a church split. It was really, really difficult. And because we were a non-denominational church, it meant that we didn't have any natural partner churches or sister churches or other churches in our network who were kind of working alongside us. It, It felt like we were on an island. It felt... Like we were kind of doing this all by ourselves. There was no higher governance, no higher structure, no superintendents that were going to come in and help us. And it felt like we were alone. And in that season, what made that loneliness even that much more palpable is whenever I would get online, get on Facebook or Instagram, I would see other pastor friends of mine sharing pictures of them with pastors in their networks, at their network meetings, at their gatherings, at their conferences and retreats. And I remember thinking like, I want that so bad. Like, I want to be with other churches in a relationship where it's like we are doing this together. And so before we moved here, it was about three or four years before we moved, I just started praying. I was like, God, what does that look like for me? Like, how is that going to happen? Thinking that we might even have stayed in Atlanta for a really long time and just found myself thinking like, I want that in the worst way. So then, 2016, we moved here to Milwaukee. And after we moved here, I started to learn about the Brook family of churches, which if if you're not familiar with that term or what that is, there's a lot of churches in the Milwaukee area that have the word Brook in their name. We're Meadowbrook, and there's Southbrook, and Elmbrook, and Eastbrook, and Northbrook. And I realized like, oh, we are part of this group of churches that has a shared history, that has a shared legacy, and we kind of all came from these. And I started to meet the different pastors of these different churches. And somewhere along the way, we started to gather regularly, and somewhere along the way, I kind of assumed this informal leadership role of gathering people and coordinating a schedule and making sure everybody had Zoom links and making sure we got together for lunch and where. And it's just kind of been this informal coordination leadership role. So it was December just last month, and we were going into the new year. And one of my responsibilities is putting a schedule of our gatherings together for the year, making sure it gets distributed through a communication channel so everybody knows, and then just kind of making sure the meeting and the gathering happens. And so I do all that at the end of December, which like I almost forgot about it because you have so many other things going on, but I'm like, we need that. And then I send it out, and we had our first gathering this past week in 2024, it was a Zoom meeting, and I I get on the call really excited to see everybody, and only like half the people are there. Now, sometimes that happens, right? Like people have other things going on. Sometimes people miss these things, but I've really loved being a part of this group of pastors, and I was like, where is everybody? Like, what? why aren't they here today? And so I start looking through my communication, and I realize like, oh, I made a communication error. I didn't send it to everybody. So like, how are they going to show up to the meeting if they don't know that it's happening? And then I look over the schedule again, and I'm like, oh, I made a mistake in the schedule for next month, which means I got to go correct that and go send that out. And all of this is happening like while we're on the meeting. Like I, I figure it all out there. And I start to feel like, oh, this is a burden. Like this is a drag. This is just another thing that I have to go and do. I got to correct the schedule. I got to resend it. I got to apologize for people because they didn't know the meeting was happening. And it started to feel like a burden. It was one of these things that like, I really wanted. I really, lo- I've really longed for to have these relationships with other pastors so I don't feel alone. But then, not just this week, but there are other times, it feels kind of like a burden. And I wonder if anybody here resonates with that. Meaning, you've had this desire for something. You're like, oh, I wish that I could experience that. Oh, I'd long to be able to have that. And then somewhere along the way, you actually get it. 
Like it actually comes into your life and you're getting to realize the thing you've longed for, but then after a while it feels like a drudge. It feels like just another thing I've got to do. Anybody been there before? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, there's this saying that captures kind of that experience, and the saying is that familiarity can lead to unfamiliarity. Familiarity can lead to unfamiliarity, meaning you can become so acquainted with that thing you long for that at one point in time it seemed magnificent and overwhelming and amazing, and then you get it and you become so familiar with it, it loses some of its intrigue. It loses some of its awe and wonder and fascination. Now, you can say this same phrase in a little bit different way with a little bit stronger language that goes, familiarity can breed contempt. Ever heard that before? Familiarity can breed contempt. You can become so familiar with something that it's not just that you lose the awe and wonder of it, but you actually lose the appreciation for it and you grow to disdain it. For me, this week, that was what was happening on that call. I'd become so familiar with this thing that I had longed for at one point in time that it actually began to feel like a burden and just another thing I have to do. And what happens when that same thing happens in our faith? That we become so familiar with our faith and we become so familiar with Jesus' death and resurrection that we lose the awe and wonder of what He has done for us. We lose the awe and wonder of what it means for somebody who's been dead three days to come back to life, to usher in new creation, and make good on this promise of I'm making all things new. What happens when we take for granted His grace and His mercy and His free offer of salvation and engaging in spiritual practices feels like a drudge? What, what do we do? Well, our passage today kind of highlights the reality that familiarity can lead to unfamiliarity, even in our faith. And Jesus has a very interesting response to a group of people who have maybe grown too familiar with what they believe. This is what we read. This is John chapter 2, starting in verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, one of the unique features of John and the way that he tells his story is that he structures his story of Jesus around different Jewish festivals. In the first half of John, which is chapter 1 through chapter 12, there will be six references to six different Jewish festivals that Jesus attends. And you see them on this list. The first one is here in chapter 2. It's the Passover. And then in chapter 5, we have an unnamed Jewish festival. It just says one of the Jewish festivals was approaching. Then in chapter 6, you have the Passover referenced again, which means a whole year has gone by between chapter 2 and chapter 6. And you have the Feast of Tabernacles in chapter 7, the Feast of Dedications in chapter 10. And then again, the Passover is referenced again in chapter 11 and chapter 12. It's the same Passover. Now, what these Jewish festivals did was they brought Jews from all over Israel to Jerusalem to celebrate these festivals. They brought Jews, including Jesus, from everywhere to come to Jerusalem. And all but one of these references, there's a specific moment where Jesus is in the temple at these festivals, engaging with people, healing people, teaching the crowds. Anytime Jesus goes to Jerusalem for a festival, he goes to the temple. So what John is doing with his story about Jesus and structuring it this way and continually putting Jesus in the temple at these festivals is he's highlighting the prominence of the temple in Jewish life. Because for a first century Jew, what the temple did for them is it retold their story. It told the story about creation. It told the story about their rescue and their redemption from Egypt. 
It told the story of God's desire to dwell among his people. It told the story of how they were unique, distinct, and special because the presence of God was with them in a way that it wasn't with other nations. This temple was wildly significant. In in some ways, you could think of it like this. The temple for first century Israel did the same thing that Washington, D.C. and the monuments in D.C. do for us. Right? If you were to go to Washington, D.C., you could go see the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Vietnam Memorial, you go to the Capitol, the Washington Memorial, all of the different museums. And what do they do? They tell the story of our country. They tell the story of who we are. So they have this identity component to them. The temple for Israel works in the exact same way. But one of the unique differences of the temple is that it wasn't just a memorial building, it had spiritual weight to it. It had spiritual significance. It was a sacred space because it was believed that the presence of God lived in that temple. The presence of God was there in the center of it. So therefore, it was loaded with rules and regulations and restrictions of how you operate, how you behave, who can go in the temple, who can go in different parts of the temple, what clothes you had to wear, how you had to prepare yourself before you go in. The temple was this wildly significant place, not just for the story that it told, but the sacredness that it held because it was believed that God dwelt there. And in this story, where Jesus goes to Jerusalem for a Passover, the very first place that John puts Jesus in this moment is in the temple. We read in verse 14, in the temple courts. Now, this picture here is intended to be a model of what the temple looked like in first century Jewish world. And you'll notice that there are two different courtyards. It says here in verse 14 that Jesus is in the temple courts. There's two courtyards. You have those yellow circles and ovals. That's known as the outer courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles. And then that purple star is the inner courtyard. So in this story, it's most likely that Jesus is in the outer courtyard, that that place where there's the yellow circles. He's there, and this is what he finds as he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover and enters the temple. Verse 14, in the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he says, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. So Jesus enters the temple, and what he sees looks more like a livestock auction than it does a house of worship. There's cattle everywhere. It looks more like somebody's trying to sell livestock than it does an actual house of worship. And Jesus creates quite a scene. Like he's opening up the gates. He's making some sort of makeshift whip. He's smacking cattle in the backside, give them a good kick, rushing them out. He's turning over tables, which means coins and change are flying everywhere. He says, get this out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. It would be like if you're a student and you're sitting in class and another student walks in late and they walk right up to the teacher's desk and all the papers, books, and things are on the desk and they just push it off. And then they go to the board and whatever the teacher's doing, they just erase it and write something new. Now, if you're a student in a certain class, you'd be like, that would be the most amazing day of school, right? But it would be filled with shock and horror if a student walked into their classroom and treated their teacher and that space in that way. It would be a jaw-dropping moment. This is one of those moments for Jesus. He is doing something that is catching everybody's attention, and they are filled with shock and horror by what he is doing. Now, when this passage is read... There are two things that are often assumed that aren't necessarily in the text. 
Meaning the first one is the motivation of the temple officials. Sometimes people assume what's going on here is that the temple officials are trying to take advantage of people who are coming for the festival. They are selling animals to try and make a profit, which means they're just greedy and money hungry. They don't really care about the people. They're just trying to line their pockets. But selling animals in Jerusalem around festival time wasn't all that uncommon because it was more convenient for travelers who are traveling from all over to buy a sacrifice in Jerusalem than to carry animals with them as they travel. So that wasn't all that uncommon. But I wonder if what is happening here is that they've grown too comfortable and too familiar and growing too convenient, trying to have too much convenience in their faith, and they've fallen into a place where unfamiliarity, excuse me, where familiarity can lead to unfamiliarity. They've grown too comfortable because it's thought that maybe the selling of animals was a normal practice and actually okay, not outside the bounds of what first century Jews could do, but it should have taken place outside the temple. But they've just grown too comfortable with the temple that they've started to bring it into the temple. Familiarity can lead to unfamiliarity. Familiarity can breed contempt. Now, if there's anything that I need to be aware of in my faith is growing too comfortable and too casual with the work that I do. I love being casual. I mean, it is like, I can think of two months where when I first became a pastor, I wore slacks and a button-up shirt every Sunday. And you're like, no. I did it for two months. And then I asked myself the question, why am I doing this? Like, what do I have to prove to anybody that this is how a pastor is supposed to dress? So I wore jeans, my vans. I love wearing hoodies. I love being casual. Like when people come to me and say, hey, Pastor Marvel, I'm like, ooh, that seems a little too formal. Even Pastor Brian at times seems a little too formal. I love being casual. I love the casual nature of our church. But sometimes we can bring casuality, if that's even a word. I don't know. Maybe I'm making up words. See, I'm that casual. I'm just making up words. Like, we can be too comfortable and casual when we come before God. Like, I was thinking about it for me this week. Um, Mealtime at our house can be like herding cats. True for anybody else, right? <laughs> Mealtime can be like, as soon as you sit down, I resonate with whatever Miss Jackie said. Somebody's like, do we have to cook dinner every night? I'm like, yes, because the kids will never eat it. There's complaints. There's fights. I don't like this. I don't want this. So right when we sit down, like, what are we supposed to do before we eat? We're supposed to pray. And so sometimes just to, like, get through it, I'm like, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Amen. Let's go. Right? Like, I just sometimes approach God so casually and flippantly that maybe it highlights that familiarity is leading to unfamiliarity in my life. And maybe that's what's happening here for those who are leading the practices in the temple. Now, the other thing that's not explicitly stated in this moment that sometimes people assume is Jesus' emotional state. Now, he is showing emotion, but sometimes people assume that Jesus has fire in his eyes. He's filled with righteous anger. He's screaming and shouting at everybody, but the text doesn't say that either. It will say that he has passion in this moment, but it's not as though he is exerting emotional wrath in this moment. But it is a moment of rebuke for Jesus. And that wasn't all that uncommon for Jesus in his ministry. Meaning there are times when Jesus gets confrontational. There are times when Jesus says hard things. He'll say to Peter somewhere along the way, get behind me, Satan. Like, ouch, that's a stinging phrase. Get behind me, Satan. He says that to one of his closest followers. He says somewhere to a crowd who is wanting him to heal somebody who is lame and diseased, he says, how long do I have to put up with you, you perverse and wicked generation? Like Jesus at times says hard things. Jesus at times rebukes people for how they are engaging with him. Sometimes he gets confrontational. And when we see those things happening in the Gospels, and Jesus is doing those things, the very first thing we should ask is, do I need to hear that as well? Is, is that true of me? 
we need to be self-reflective and honest and say, when Jesus rebukes people in the Scriptures, is that also true of me? Meaning, am I coming to Jesus too flippantly and too casually, losing sight of who He is as the King of kings, Lord of lords, over all creation? Now, not only does Jesus rebuke what's happening in the temple, he also refines. He's refining what's happening in the temple, and he does it from two vantage points. One, he does it from the vantage point of a prophet, meaning prophets in the Old Testament didn't just have a message that they spoke. They also embodied the message that they spoke. There were times they did prophetic acts that communicated something more vividly than anything they could ever say verbally. So for uh, Ezekiel, it says in Ezekiel 4, I think, he was told by God to lie on his left side for 390 days to demonstrate to the Israelites that judgment is coming for 390 years of disobedience. He had to lay on his left side for over a year to demonstrate to the people that judgment was coming. After those 390 days, he had to flip to his right side for 40 days and lay on his side for another 40 days. During that time, he could cook food, but he was told to cook food over human excrement. And he said, that's really gross. And so God said, okay, let it be the dung of a cow instead. That was supposed to be the fuel he used to cook his food all to send a message to the people of Israel that judgment is coming. No wonder when God called prophets to be a prophet, they're like, "Mm -mm. no, thank you. I would rather not, right? Isaiah had to walk around stripped, barefoot and naked, out in public, again, to capture that judgment is coming. So prophets didn't just speak a message, they embodied a message. And so Jesus here, in part, is embodying a message, but he's also coming fulfilling a prophetic word from Malachi 3. This is what we read in Malachi 3. It says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, which is probably a reference to John the Baptist. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come where? To his temple. For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will pure, purify the Levites. And who are they? The people who lead what happens in the temple. And he will refine them like gold and silver. So Jesus isn't just speaking a message. He's embodying a message that the religious system of the first century Jewish people needs refining. So he's coming and refining in the vein of a prophet. But he also at the same time makes it personal. And he does it in three ways. The first is relational, because did you notice what he called the temple? He didn't say, get out of here, get out of the temple. He said, get these things out of, in verse 16, my father's house. He's personalizing his relationship to the temple. He does the same thing in Luke 2 when he's just a boy, right? He's at Passover with his parents. They lose him. Eventually, they find him. And what does he say? Well, didn't you know that I'd be where? At my father's house. See, it's important that our faith is personal because if it's not personal, it can easily become personal transactional, meaning we approach God just simply to get something from Him rather than to fully experience Him. We treat God like a vending machine. We go to a vending machine, and we have all these options of all the different things we can get. And we think, if I just put in a few coins, if I put a few, push a few buttons, it will spit out the thing that I want. And sometimes we treat that God that way. We come to church, and we think, oh, I have all these options of things I can do, and I can pay my dues, and I hopefully and should get what God owes me because I've paid something. Or we treat God as though he's a genie in a bottle, and we think to ourselves, if I can just get him, if I can figure out the crack the magic code to get him to come out of the bottle, then he will grant me all of my heart's desires. Right? It's a transactional thing. Or we treat God as a celestial Santa Claus, 
I want to do the things that I need to do so I can be on the nice list, not the naughtiness list, and then God will owe me and give me all the things that I want. So sometimes when our faith loses the personal element, it becomes transactional, and we're just trying to get something from God. But we also see in this moment that Jesus refines the temple in a personal way an emotion comes out. Not only is it relational for Jesus, but it's also emotional. Because as he's creating this big stir, we read this in verse 17, his disciples remembered. Now, we don't know if his disciples are remembering what they're about to remember in this moment, or if it's later on, because later in the passage, we're told that the disciples remember something of this moment after the resurrection. So we don't know if it's in the moment or after the fact, but this is what they remember, that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me, which is here a quote from Psalm 69. And so the remembering that Jesus had passion, not about an institution or a religious building, he had passion and conviction specifically about the relationship he had with his father. Which means for us, like, do we have that same passion about our relationship with God? Do we have conviction about it? Or are we pursuing it just for some sort of transaction and out of some sort of obligation? I just come here because I'm supposed to. I come here because this is the thing that makes me tell me and helps other people see I'm actually a pretty good person because I go to church. Or I do this because... My significant other really wants me to be here, so they drag me along. Do I do it out of obligation? Do I do it just to make my parents happy because they're in town, and so I got to show them that, hey, I'm still following through on the way you raised me? Do we approach Jesus because of a transaction that we hope to acquire, or out of obligation because we think we have to, or because we really have passion and commitment around what we believe? That God is good and He's faithful. He created everything. He's holding it all together. He's got a plan for us and for this world, and we get to participate with Him in that plan. So, for Jesus, He's refining the temple in the vein of a prophet, but also from a personal vantage point. We see it in His relationship with His Father. It's relational, it's emotional, and it's also vocational for Jesus meaning he's doing something here that captures the calling that is on his life. Because after Jesus causes this scene, we're told that he is approached and questioned by the Jews, probably those who are leading what's happening in the temple. And we see this in verse 18. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Essentially, they're asking the question, who do you think you are? What gives you the right to come in here and treat all of this in this way? And then Jesus says in verse 19, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Now, on one hand, that's a laughable statement. Like for those of you who have been helping out with the demo work around here, like you know that is a laughable statement. It has taken us more than three days just to tear this thing apart. It's going to take us way more than three days to put it back together. You know that that's a laughable statement. The Jews in this moment also know. You can almost hear them laugh when they say in verse 20, they replied. You can almost hear them laugh. It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it again in three days? It's like one guy turns to his friend, this guy's a nut job, right? Like they know. Like He's way out of his mind. There's no way that's possible. But Jesus isn't making a laughable statement here. He's giving a cryptic statement here. He's giving a riddle, if you were, which is sometimes the way Jesus works to really capture, people, capture people's attention, to draw them in and be like, what does he really mean by that? Because he's not referencing destroy this temple we read in verse 21, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. See, Jesus came not only to rebuke what was happening in the temple and refine what was happening in the temple, he came to replace the temple. Because what is the significance again of the temple? What gives it its spiritual weight? It was thought that the presence of God, 
dwelt in the inner courts of the temple. Essentially, the temple was a place where heaven and earth overlapped. It was a place where heaven kissed earth. It was a place where heaven came to rest upon this world. And it was understood by the Jews, if you want to go to meet with God, the place you have to go is the temple. And what Jesus is saying is not anymore, because I have come, in a sense, to replace the temple. It's not that you go to the temple to experience God's presence. You simply come to me, because I am the place where heaven touches earth. I am sent from heaven to walk amongst this earth to bring God's presence everywhere I go. And the sign that he's giving isn't this temple altercation. He's pointing towards the resurrection, that there will come a time when he launches this project to make all things new. Because we read in verse 22, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. And then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. Jesus is trying to capture that God is bigger than brick and mortar. He's trying to capture that God is bigger than pews and pulpits, but that Jesus takes the presence of God everywhere he goes, and he busts it out of the temple, making the temple obsolete. And guess what? Here's what's so wild about our faith, and this is the thing that should never cause us to lose our sense of awe and wonder. What's true of Jesus is also true of you. Amen. Let that sink in. What's true of Jesus is also true of you. So when Jesus receives this declar declaration, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased, that's true of you. When it says that he is the perfect, righteous, spotless lamb, in a sense that's true of you, not because you have that inherently in yourself, but because you receive that, because you are thought to be in Christ, and Christ is in you. And when Jesus says, I'm the new temple, that same thing is true of you, which means you do what the temple did. That's what John is trying to get at in part with his gospel, is that you do what the temple did, meaning you have the ability to bring the presence of God wherever you go. It was thought that, that the temple was this spiritual hot spot. That man, if you got close to the temple, you were in the spiritual hot spot. Guess what? You now are a spiritual hot spot because you have the spirit in you. This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6. He'll say it again in Ephesians 2. 1 Peter, it says it as well, that you are a temple of God. They don't do that to say, now, be careful for how you behave. It's like, no, no, no. Like, you bring the presence of God with you everywhere you go. And what Miss Jackie said this morning is that there are people who need to know that God is with them because they find themselves in moments and places and seasons of life where the circumstances that they are experiencing, they want to stop. But it doesn't always stop. And what they need to know is that God is with them and he's for them in those moments. And you have the ability to bring that to them. Amen. You get to do what the temple did by bringing the presence of God everywhere you go. So whether that's going to Metro Market and walking the aisles, hopefully you have your antenna up that, that I have the Spirit of God with me. And I can go into this place and begin to share the love of Jesus with everybody I meet, whether it's at the grocery store, your workplace, your neighborhood, you get to do what the temple did because Jesus and his spirit is in you. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is a hard question, which this passage kind of gets at at the end. This is verse 23. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs that he was performing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. And he did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. 
There's this threefold repetition of the word believed at the end of this passage. You see it in verse 22, the disciples believed. You see it in verse 23, that the people believed. And you see it in verse 24, Jesus would not entrust himself. It's the same word as the word believed, which means we, have, we said when Jesus does something in the scriptures, the first question we should ask, is that true of me? So the question we need to ask is, do we have a faith that Jesus doesn't believe in? Meaning, is our faith transactional? Is our faith obligational? Is our faith trying to please something or someone or just trying to get something from God? Or has it slipped into apathy? Do we have a faith that Jesus doesn't believe in? And what we need is what the temple needed, is refinement. We need, we need refinement in our lives. And if that's true, the question is how? How do we do that? Well, the first way is by naming it. Saying like, yes, I have grown too familiar with what I believe. The other thing is that maybe we need to spend time with people who are where we once were. Meaning, go back to those moments when you desired something in your faith, and you were blown away about who Jesus was, but you've grown too comfortable and too familiar. You need to find yourself with people who are in that place of awe and wonder. Now, sometimes they can be annoying, right? You can be like, ah, because you've grown so like old or whatever in your faith. Well, that should be a wake-up call to you that maybe I need to renew my first love, as Jesus says in the book of Revelation, by spending time with people who are where you once were, in hopes that the love, the desire, the passion and conviction that you had for your faith can be renewed. So may your faith stay vibrant, alive, and not become too familiar. May you stay open to God's refining work in your life, and may you see that you are a temple of God's presence, and you carry it with you everywhere you go. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for the way that you have just unleashed your presence on our lives and in this world. We ask, Lord, that we would be people who could carry the weight well of your presence, that we would feel it and we would know that we have the Spirit in us, working through us, and that we get to share your love and your goodness with everyone we meet. Give us vision and imagination for that. Help us to see and know that you are a good and gracious God. And may we open our lives to be used by you. Amen.